Can I have all of the panelists up front, please? And then we will begin in five minutes. All right? All the panelists, would you please come to the front? And we will begin our program in five minutes. Tita 
Testing, testing, one, two, three, go. I did it to myself, didn't I? Check, check. Yes, yes, yes. Good evening. Before we begin our program, there are a few preliminary announcements. So I'm going to ask if you would please come, Professor Adams, at this moment right here. Good evening, everyone. Y'all ready for this dynamic panel and some serious discussion? Uh, I just want to inform you, my name is Professor Hunter Adams III. Um, I'm a cultural neuroscientist and also president of the Royal Circle Foundation based in Baltimore and Chicago. Um, I want to invite you tomorrow, if you're up early, around 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., myself and Professor Leyland Jackson from Kennedy King are going to be doing Black Panther Paradox Peril and Possibility. It'll be a two hour uh, conversation from 11 to 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Carruthers Center for Inner City Studies, 400 East Oakwood, room 403. Also, one last thing, if you're in Washington, D.C. on July the 12th, uh, my organization is co-sponsoring with the Black Psychiatrists of America and Congressman Elijah Cummings, a forum on the mental health status of black people. And this year will be on sexual harassment. Uh, you can see me afterwards and I can give you the website and other information. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is also a plethora of information. Um, spelling out Wakanda um, or the Black Panther in detail. And so that, that information is um, to my right, your left. Okay. And also a brochure on behalf of the um, Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference that gives um, some history about who we are and also the work in which we do. So that is your announcement. <laughs> your announcement. <laughs> Um, now we will have a greeting on behalf of our president, which I will read. 
Welcome for the Black Panther event. I write to welcome you to this exciting and historic panel discussion on the cultural phenomenon, the Black Panther. We are honored to join the Bayard Rustin Society and the Murray Rustin Social Justice Institute of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference in hosting this historic event. It has long been a thread in the history of Chicago Theological Seminary to encourage such groundbreaking cultural and theological engagement. I dare say the fact that the Black Panther has become a global phenomenon as the highest grossing movie of its kind bespeaks its cultural significance. While I regret that I am unable to join you this evening for this important conversation, the event is in capable hands. Quincy James Reinhardt is one of the stellar PhD students we have here at CTS, and I have every high confidence that his leadership will make this a truly memorable evening. I do hope that the generative creativity sparked in this conversation will inspire you all. Please know that CTS will always be a partner in the curation an excavation of transformative cultural meaning, such as envisioned by this panel discussion. I look forward to other opportunities for us to share this work of history, shaping imaginary. Wakanda forever. <laughs> Stephen G. Ray, Jr., <laughs> President, Chicago Theological Seminary, President, the Society of the Study of Black Religion. I will go. The Bayard Rustin Society of CTS and the Murray Rustin Social Justice Institute of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference is excited to partner together to discuss this historic film, The Black Panther. Both institutions are ecumenical, interfaith, political, and historical organizations committed to social justice uplift. Many may ask, who are these two figures you speak about? The question as to who was Bayard Rustin is often asked by clergy persons, academic and students alike. The life and witness of Bayard Rustin was that of a radical revolutionary who helped to transform the world to become moral agents of social change. When people hear the name Bayard Rustin, many are unfamiliar with who this man was or the great accomplishments he made in American history. Those who may be familiar with Rustin automatically link him to homosexuality as an identifier. Although Rustin was gay, he certainly offered more than his sexual orientation to the cause of social justice. Rustin, might I say, was a complex person, as most people are. He was born March 17, 1912 in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and was raised by his grandparents, Julia and Jankford Rustin. Rustin, in many ways, was a triple threat to the political and social establishment. He was a communist, Quaker, and gay. Likewise, when people hear the name Polly Murray, many look puzzled. Polly was born November 20th, 1910 in Baltimore, Maryland. As a mixed race orphan, Polly grew up in segregated North Carolina before traveling to New York where she attended Hunter College and became a labor activist in the 1930s. From undergraduate school, she enrolled into Howard Law School. It was her brilliant legal scholarship who helped Thurgood Marshall challenge segregation frontally in the landmark Brown versus Board of Education case. Polly, in many regards, was a trendsetter. She was the first African American in 1965 to earn a SJD from Yale Law School after being denied admittance into Harvard Law School because of her gender. And in 1975, was the first openly gay priest ordained in the Episcopal Church. 
Bayard Rustin and Polly Murray both believe in transcending all racial and sexual boundaries that try to take them off course. As the Bayard Rustin Society and the Murray Rustin Social Justice Institute continues to make the vision and mission plain, we ask that you consider investing in both organizations so that the work of Bayard Rustin and Polly Murray may be celebrated, actualized, and institutionalized. If by chance, now we're in the church, somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> if by chance you would like to invest in these organizations, you have a card that you can place your information on and if you would like to make a donation to the Chicago Theological Seminary, you may write a check and also um, uh, special attention, um, place on it special attention to buy a Russian society. Or if you would like to make a um, donation to the Samuel um, DeWitt Proctor Conference, please attention it, Murray Rustin Social Justice Institute. We greatly appreciate your kind generosity. In closing, Polly Murray once wrote, quote, True community is based upon equality, mutuality, and reciprocity. It affirms the richness of the individual diversity as well as the common human tides that bind us together. This marks, or the marks of a community of faith are communal, mutual trust, sharing, and fellowship, close quote. Let us continue in the struggle together as we seek to make the vision a reality. Thank you. I don't know why he lowered the microphone. <laughs> Good evening. I am Iva Carruthers, and we are really, really excited about your presence here as the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference launches our Pauli e. Murray Bayard Worston Institute. We're honored to host this event with our partner, Chicago Theological Seminary, and its student led Bayard Rustin Society, uh, student led by none other than Quincy Reinhardt. I stand here very privileged with two hats on. I have the double honor of being the general secretary of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, but I'm also a lifetime trustee of the Chicago Theological uh, Seminary. And so it's indeed a pleasure for me to always come into this space and to have my spirit renewed. Um, I've had some phenomenal experiences during uh, this journey, but I, as I think about this moment, I'm very reflective on where we are in relationship to the challenges of the 21st century technologies that we all are trying to navigate. Um, my experiences include um, studies and interest, I guess you would say as a futurist and as a humanist, um, with a lens of being a pan-African womanist, a sociologist, and a software developer in the very embryonic stages of the development of the internet. And so it got so bad for me, I think I could say that I was kind of driven into ministry in my quest and private conversations with God to just say, Lord, what are you trying to say? What are you doing? Where are you taking us? And uh, it was really trying to sort out what I had come to uh, consider to be computing, competing worldviews an African worldview and a Western worldview, uh, a competing spirit um, that has to be understood and embraced in order for us to create a different kind of reality, certainly for people of African descent, locally, nationally, and indeed globally. And right now, as we stand here, we know that the UN has declared this to be the decade of people of international, uh, the international decade of people of African descent. And so all over the world, there are these kinds of conversations ha taking place in an effort to uh, curate um, our experiences and a strategy and a new way forward. I have to acknowledge that my Hebrew Bible 
teacher is in the room, Dr. Cheryl Anderson from Garrett. And so Cheryl, we've come a long way uh, <laughs> since some of those classroom conversations, but this is a very serious moment, I think a very prophetic moment for us. Uh, through it all, I learned that so-called technological process was really a reductive process. I began to think very deeply about what it means to, as a software developer, to translate bytes into data and data into information and information into knowledge. And that's where I got stuck because the translation of knowledge into wisdom was not really happening. And in the end, I really learned that my grandmother's folk wisdom was more valuable than all of the lessons of epistemology and methodology and phenomenology that I had been exposed to. And in fact, her wisdom was what I would call the quintessential hermeneutic to understand the complexities of competing worldviews. She said over and over again, baby, never forget it is better to not know the answers to the right questions than to know the right answers to the wrong questions. This wisdom text of my grandmother is my introduction to this occasion. We are in a battle of competing worldviews. We are caught between a Starbucks reality of Afrophobia and the dehumanization of people of African descent versus a Wakanda vision of a different kind of world. And I am confident that the stellar moderators and panel will guide our interpretation of the Black Panther down trails that will provoke, that will stimulate, that will challenge, that will inspire and encourage our collective commitment to a new way forward. They may not know the answers, but I am sure they know some questions that we collectively ought to be asking. Given what we're up against, I'll end with one question that continues to haunt me, inspired by the words of Congressman Barbara Lee. And essentially the question is, in the struggle, how do you not become the evil against which you are fighting? With that said, on behalf of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference and the Chicago Theological Seminary, welcome to this event. Good evening. My name is Devin Crawford. I serve as the Addie Wyatt Bill Lucy Fellow for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, and it is my pleasure to introduce our moderators for this evening's panel conversation. Our first moderator that I'd like to introduce is uh, Associate Professor Emeritus Herbert Allen. Uh, Herbert Allen served as co-chair, uh, associate chair, and director of advertising studies of the Marketing De Communication Department, now merged with the Communication Department at Columbia College in Chicago. Prior to his teaching career, Allen served as an advertising agency account executive, creative director, media director, new business development strategist, and adver advertiser to agency presidents. Having begun his advertising agency career at the Leo Burnett Company, in the 1960s. He also served at Early Ludgen, Ludgen Advertising, Foot Cone and Belding, Vince Colors Advertising, Neefield Paley and Kuhn Advertising, and Burrell Advertising. Mr. Allen authored numerous articles that have appeared in Advertising Age, the Bible publication of American advertising in industry, further reflecting his interdisciplinary range Mr. Allen is also an Emmy-nominated television producer, writer, and writer who served in staff and freelance capacities at the NBC and ABC television stations in Chicago, and with Central City Productions, formerly a subsidiary of Tribune Broadcasting. Beyond his work in advertising and mass communication, Herbert Allen is a playwright with a multicultural perspective. Please welcome Mr. Herbert Allen. Our second moderator will be Zainab Sahar. 
Zainab is a PhD student at Chicago Theological Seminary, specializing in comparative religion and gender, sexuality, and Judaism and Islam. She holds an MA in Religious Studies from CTS and a BA, a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Jewish Studies from Hampshire College. Zainab divides her time between organizing, academic scholarship, and writing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderators for this evening's conversation. Hello, I'm Zainab, and I would like to introduce three of our panelists. First, our very own Reverend Dr. Christoph Ringer. Professor Ringer's research interests include theology and social ethics, African American religion, public theology, religion and social sciences, religion and politics, critical theory, and African American religion, and cultural studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christoph Ringer. I would next like to introduce Dr. Amara Enya. She is a public policy expert on city and state policy as well as international affairs slash foreign policy with expertise in Central Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. She writes extensively on issues of education, economic development, fiscal policy, equity and policy, and systems thinking. Please welcome Dr. Amara Enya. And Eric Elias Glenn. Like many of us, Eric Elias Glenn began his career with a calling to address the daily injustices faced by racial, sexual, and gender minorities. With more than a decade in HIV prevention, he is now the executive director of Chicago's Black Gay Men Caucus. Eric is a graduate of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, and University of Michigan. Please welcome Eric Elias Green. So it's my honor to introduce Holly Joyner. Holly Joyner serves as a program associate at Sammy Good Proctor Conference. And she's previously, she served as a nonprofit non organizations, including Next Up and Higher Achievement. Uh, she's focused on community service and social justice. She has served as a mentor, a summer teacher, achievement coach. She's so young. Uh, uh, at Thomas H. Henderson Middle School in Richmond, Virginia. Holly attended the University of Memphis where she studied a month in Ghana and West Africa as part of the African and African American Institute. She also studied uh, Latin American history and culture for a month in Juan Jose, Costa Rica. Holly graduated in 2014 with a BA in International Studies and a minor in history. Holly Joyner. Next, we have Dr. Joanne Marie Terrell. Uh, the Reverend Joanne Dr. Marie Terrell is the Associate, Prof Associate Professor of Theology and Ethics and the Arts at Chicago Theological Seminary. Uh, she's a womanist theologian whose spirituality and scholarship are shaped by diverse wisdom, traditions, and religions, including Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Christianity. She is the author of Power in the Blood, The Cross in the American, African American Experience. Dr. Terrell earned a dual Bachelor of Arts degree in Behavioral Science and Philosophy and Religion from Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. She also earned a Master of Divinity and Master of Philosophy and Doctor of Philosophy from Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Here at CTS, Dr. Terrell teaches systematic theology and advanced seminars such as Proto-Womanist Theology, St. Augustine, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Malcolm X, and Womanist and Feminist Christologies. Each year in her course, AIDS and Violence, she produces an original stage play combining art and activism. Most recently, Things in Heaven utilized an interfaith lens to address violence against transgender women. Dr. Joan Marie Terrell. And last but certainly not least, we have Reverend Melek E. M. Thomas. 
an, an ordained minister and community activist with a heart for creating innovative ministry that's needed and developing leadership skills amongst people of all generations, both churched and unchurched. Pastor Mellick, as he is affectionately known, was called um, as the Senate pastor-elect of the Christian Love Missionary Baptist Church on the west side of Chicago in December of 2017. Prior to his call, Reverend Mellick served as a youth pastor at Covenant UCC in South Holland, Illinois, where in his first six months, over 110 young people, wow, made decisions for Christ. Mellick is a graduate of Howard University with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Communication and Culture and a minor in Community and Economic Development. He has also, also received his Master of Divinity from the Sammy DeWitt Proctor School of Theology in Virginia Union, at Virginia Union uh, University under the tutelage of Dean John W. Kinney. He has also completed studies in both Chicago Theological Seminary and Princeton Theological Seminary respectively. Reverend Malik E. M. Thomas. So does that mean I go first? That's fine. <laughs> okay. First giving honor to God. I'm, 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 we're, not, we're not at the Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, good evening. It's good to be here. Uh, this is a, a, a somewhat of a homecoming for me. Uh, I'm grateful to be here amongst such a great cloud of witnesses, both seen uh, and unseen. I'm just grateful uh, to be in this space. Thank you, uh, Reverend, soon to be Dr. Uh, Elder Quincy uh, Reinhardt for the invitation. Uh, I'm grateful and also my Shiro who has me shaking in my boots right now, uh, Mama Iva Carruthers, uh, who uh, every time I, I see her, I gotta make sure I sound smart uh, <laughs> so that uh, I don't uh, embarrass her. Uh, but I only have five to seven minutes and because I am a Baptist preacher, you know five to seven translates to 50. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I, I really want to look at uh, Black Panther was a very, very important movie, very powerful movie uh, in the intellectual spectrum. Uh, of Africana studies, in my judgment. Uh, and, and there's so many different directions in which you can go to look at Black Panther. Uh, and, and I want to, since we are in this space that is co-sponsored by the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, uh, I, I want to look at, if you can look at the, um, if you have something, you should have something in your seat that hopefully you will fill out uh, today. Uh, it's the Disciple Circle card for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. Uh, and in the top left corner, you see the logo for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. This isn't just something uh, that the Proctor Conference got off of clip art uh, on Microsoft Word. Uh, but this is the image of the Haitian Maroon who is sounding the cry of liberation and freedom. Uh, and uh, we, we look at this, but uh, one of the reasons why we have to really understand this is that maroon space has always been uh, an integral part of African people dealing with the absurdity of white supremacy, particularly in the West. And so I want to look at, uh, for the next few moments, Wakanda as a maroon space. Uh, and I think that that's a necessary perspective, that Wakanda is not just something, uh, it, because it was created in the midst of a time where African people in America were trying to find solace against uh, the, the craziness of lynching uh, and Jim and Jane Crow. And so I want to look at it uh, from the perspective of a maroon space. And, and when, I, when I think of it like this, I, I, uh, and, and as the space is co-sponsored by uh, the Murray Rustin, uh, uh, the Murray Rustin Institute, uh, I, I think about Polly Murray and her uh, coming from my hometown of Baltimore uh, and in being integral uh, in her development at Hunter College. I can't think about Hunter College and not think about the great Baba John Henry Clark. Uh, and, and John Henry Clark uh, had a quote that said, if you start the history of African people with slavery, uh, everything since then will look like progress. Uh, and, and what he meant and, and what uh, our, our dear uh, ancestor Pauli Murray and, uh, and what Bayard Rustin sought to create 
uh, was a continuation of the, not just an African need to survive, but an African need to just exist and be themselves. That, that, uh, and, and this is one of my uh, frustrations with a lot of uh, Negro academics, is that it's from always from the perspective of just trying to survive uh, instead of just trying to be. Uh, we talk about uh, Paul Tillich was not the first person to come up with the concept of the courage to be. Uh, but I believe it was the first African to say, get your hands off me. Uh, and when, when we look at Wakanda uh, and the idea of Wakanda and it being created in the Black Panther comics, uh, that it is essentially, I think, uh, supposed to be a maroon space. And, and I think there's four ways. The first way is a space with our own language. A space with our own language. One of my favorite books by Ngugi Wa Thiango, uh, entitled Something Torn and New. He, he, he talks about the resurrection of African languages on the continent after having been colonized for so many years where people uh, would be speaking French and speaking, speaking English and Dutch and Afrikaners, languages that are not indigenous to us, uh, that there is this now resurrection of this importance of writing because he was a novelist. Uh, he wrote novels in his native tongue and the revolutionary act therein. Uh, and one of the most important things I thought about uh, with Wakanda, as you saw in Black Panther, is that they were not all speaking the same African language. Some were speaking Zulu, some were speaking Kosa, some were speaking uh, Asante. So there's so many different African languages in there, and, and we privileged the accent, we privileged all those things. That, that's it's so important. One of the things I've always envied about our, our, our Latino, Latina brothers and sisters and, uh, was the fact that they could speak their own language and folk around them couldn't hear what they were saying. That, that's beneficial when you're trying to plan revolution. That when people can't understand those who are oppressing you or colonizing you, can't understand what you're saying. And the Neo-Pentecostal in me thinks about speaking in tongues. This is a heavenly language. That there are people around you uh, that, that, that are against you, that they cannot understand what you're saying. That is so important. And so Wakanda represents a space where you can speak uh, your own language. Also, it's a space where African people are subjects and not electives. I think that's so important because one of the things that I learned in my semester at Chicago Theological Seminary uh, was that I, I, I had to take systematic theology, I had to take history of Christian thought and learn about uh, all these folk uh, that are not a part of my intellectual genealogy, uh, but I had to break my scheme in order to get a class uh, with Dr. Joanne Terrell. <laughs> And oftentimes when the stories are told about African people, we are often electives, even when you look at other movies like The Help, uh, where we are elective to uh, the red-headed sister. When you look at movies like The Butler, we're an elective to the history of, of White House presidents. Anytime the stories of African people are told, we are electives and not subjects. Uh, and it reminds me, as we move forward uh, in this uh, trumped up era, uh, and, and we're trying to even be more vocal about white supremacy reminds me uh, of something that Du Bois said uh, in his collection of commencement speeches called The Education of Black People, where he's giving commencement speeches to HBCUs and he writes uh, this particular speech to Johnson C. Smith uh, University in 1960, one of the last speeches he gives before he becomes the expat uh, in Ghana. He, it's called The Negro College With or When and Why and he asks the question, what is the purpose of the HBCU, of the Negro College, after segregation, after uh, we get the Voting Rights Act, after uh, we get the housing, uh, uh, Equal Housing Act, what, what is the purpose? And the purpose is not just to continue to resist, but the purpose now becomes to exist. And the moment that we continue to think that our existence is just to resist, our entire existence becomes, exi becomes predicated on the fact that we need an oppressor. And what Wakanda does, Wakanda says, we don't need none of y'all. We're going to close ourselves out from the world, and we're going to create our own technology. We're going to create our own ways of knowing. And so I think for all of the different um, contingencies of oppressed people in here, whether we're LGBTQ, whether we're uh, persons of color that are non-black, whatever various ways, women, whatever various ways you find yourself oppressed, that as much as we resist, we have to also have the courage to exist and be ourselves outside of whether or not people approve of us. So that, that's, that's one, that's nothing. Number three, uh, a space where the intellectual genealogy was not rooted in Europe. That is the most important part for me. 
about uh, about Wakanda that Wakanda was untouched. You you could not touch Wakanda. You there was no way that you can connect it to Rousseau. You couldn't connect it to the Enlightenment. You couldn't connect it to Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. You connected it five thousand years ago, where these uh, the deities of African people came together and created and dropped uh, a, a, a thing called uh, vibranium, and out of vibranium came everything that Wakanda was able to do. You can't connect it to Europe, no matter how much uh, Henry Louis Gates may try it. You can't connect it to Europe. And then the final thing I want to uh, say is that uh, Wakanda was a space where distinction was safe. Where distinction was safe. Uh, and that's very important. If you saw those various different tribes in Wakanda, you know, a lot of people would like to say that, uh, you know, when we was all in Africa, we was all unified. Nah, we all had tribes. There was disagreement. Disagreement is as human uh, as, uh, as Trump is racist. It just is what it is. And, and so uh, what you saw in Wakanda, you had all these different uh, tribes that all coexisted. Uh, and there was only tension when they needed to solve a problem, but, but there was also an honor code. And so what we need to create, and even in spaces like this that purport themselves to be progressive and liberal, we need to make sure that distinction is safe and not just when the distinction uh, allows for you to continue in white privilege. One of the things, if I can just uh, say, share my personal experience real quick, then, then, then I'm going to pass the mic, uh, is that one of the reasons why I could not stay here at, at, at Chicago Theological Seminary, I came here because I was impressed and attracted by its legacy of fighting for oppression uh, by Charles Shelby Rooks. I was, uh, I was enthralled by that, and so I came here with that thought. But then when I was walking the hallways and I realized that some of my classmates refused to look me in the eye, or acknowledge my existence. Or, I remember this, Tiana, you remember this, we were outside the old building on, uh, on 57th, uh, and I, it was the, I think it was the first, the opening convocation. And I had, you know, I remember I used to wear that onk, that big old onk, uh, <laughs> I used to wear this big old onk on my chest, and one of, uh, uh, one of your alum looked at the onk uh, and said, is that a symbol of Satanism? Liberal, progressive, but ignorant. And so we've got to understand that we need to create spaces, even in CTS, even in the United Church of Christ, even where we purport ourselves to be liberal and progressive, where LGBTQ people, where uh, Latino, Latina people, where transgender, and, uh, and, and, and where people who are in the LGBT community who may not have a whole bunch of money to wear all the nice clothes when they go to marches. I have friends that feel excluded, who are LGBTQ, who feel excluded when they go to LGBTQ uh, events because they're not wearing and people are looking at them like they're funny and so we've got to understand that distinction ought to be safe if we want to create a Wakanda forever that means distinction needs to be safe forever so that Renita Weems doesn't have to have the experience that she had at Princeton Theological Seminary where because her thesis her dissertation was so good professors accused her of plagiarism the devil is a liar we've got to understand that distinction if we are to create a space like Wakanda distinction has to be safe so I really want to look at Wakanda as uh, a maroon space that's 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 everything I think amen Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Really? It just sounds like I'm talking. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that I am up here. I, I feel a little nervous. It's my first time here. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for welcoming me into the space and the rest of the panel. Um, I guess the, the first thing I'd want to say is I want you to know what perspective I'm talking from. And so some of that's about letting you know who I am. Um, Right now, my professional capacity, I'm executive director of Chicago Black Gay Men's Caucus. We serve uh, black, gay, bisexual, and same-gender loving men across the Chicago land area, uh, which is a great honor and responsibility. Um, I myself come to the work. I feel particularly called to justice work, um, I guess because of where I, I come from. So I'm originally from Detroit. I am from the city of Detroit, uh, southwest side. Um, which is important to uh, how I view kind of my situation within the world as an Afro-Latinx person, someone who is African-American and Mexican, um, but having kind of a mixed race community where everyone was working class. And so 
class was the equalizer there. Um, then going to University of Michigan, having a whole different culture shock kind of thing where I wasn't in an area that was 90% black anymore. Um, and then coming over to Chicago and working in a lot of areas that feel like home if home were built out and more dense. So I've had the opportunity to live in a lot of spaces, I mean, three different spaces, but three very different spaces for how black people occupy the world. And so I feel grateful for having that kind of perspective. Um, I also come from a very sex positive perspective, especially with my work. Um, I know that there is a tendency to think about sexual orientation as acts rather than identities. And so that's something to, for me to push back against. And so as I watch Black Panther, I have a lot going through my head. Um, because I watch it as someone who is wondering about the diversity behind the scenes. I'm wondering about uh, the Western eye and how that curates what we see in Wakanda and how that world is built for us um, with how fantastic and magical and wonderful it feels. Um, I tend to, I think I'm probably in the right room for this, be a pretty critical person when it comes to any kind of media that's out in the world. It's hard to enjoy it 100%. Um, and that feels like a responsibility to be aware while we're watching it. And it's funny because that leads me into my first observation when it comes to the movie is that the role of kings. Um, I think I, I grew up as a black man hearing a lot about we're descended from kings. We're descended from kings. And that was never a message that I related to very strongly. Um, and I don't, I, it wasn't actually until I saw Black Panther that that clicked for me about what that was meaning and that I was hearing we're descended from kings as a message to um, push back against our uh, forces that would seek to infantilize us or dehumanize us or to weaken us. But in defining what it meant to become a king still felt like this Western capitalist concept of give me your money and I get to live in lavish royalty. Um, but instead, when I watch, and it makes my skin tingle a little bit because the movie was so exciting. Um, I watch and I see a king whose role is all about service. It's all about service, it's all about responsibility to the community. And it's, there is no point, at least that I can remember, because I'm one of the few people probably in here that's only watched it one time. I, can, I can't remember a time where he was just relaxing and luxuriating and like this coming to America, like a farcical <laughs> idea of what Africa is. Um, it was all about responsibility. Um, and that was very exciting. Um, but then it leads into the second point, is that I guess I, I get curious, because I, I like to think that most times I come from a very queer perspective, that not only does the society seem rather heteronormative with the, uh, I think the main deviation of the, the honor guard um, to, to the king, there's a legacy of kings. No legacy of queens, necessarily. Um, I think that, and sorry for the spoilers, I'm assuming that you've all seen it if you've been here. Um, I know it's too late now, we've already <laughs> let it out back. But, in some of his uh, kind of spiritual visits to whatever realm kind of we saw him visiting and where he visits his father, we see this pantheon of past leaders. And I think I maybe saw one person I would identify as being more in the feminine spectrum of the kind of the wheel. And it did stay with me through the movie because so much power like physical power and intellect was held by women in the movie. And I'm like, oh, well that's great because you can just get right up there, but you're only close enough to see the, the main kind of um, royal position. You get just close enough. And if you're a fan of the comics like I am, although I haven't, in, just to put it out there, I haven't read the Black Panther titles, but I'm a big Marvel comic person, so I see them in all the crossovers, that the, his guard were originally there as um, representatives of the various tribes in Wakanda and were there as potential queens. And 
I mean, it kind of rubs me the wrong way because I, I read that after watching the movie, and the movie, I'm just like, oh my God, they're, you know, they're so powerful. They work as a unit. They're, they're beautiful and they're strong and she's funny, like she's not dry, everybody's three-dimensional, but are they here just to be, uh, to serve the will of the king, to serve the will of Wakanda, and to maybe one day become queen when we see Angela Bassett's character as queen as a very passive role? It, it, makes me, it makes me curious. You know, I think in, in my generosity to Black Panther, because I don't believe one movie can hold all the responsibility for overturning um, what all genres do to black people in the United States. Um, I can't put that responsibility on Black Panther, but I can use Black Panther to start a conversation to say, we need so much more. We need dozens of movies and dozens of genres to, to take us there. But in this movie in particular, I remain um, a little wanting and a little confused at how we can at, this, at one time have such powerful female characters. And in some ways, the movie is actually about them. It's not about T'Challa. It's about the queen. It's about her daughter, who is this genius at 16. Everything is built by her. It's about the, oh my god, somebody help me, the Dora Milaje or Milaje? Milaje. Okay, okay, cool. I'm not going to say it again because I'm going to mispronounce it. But the, the you know, it, and Nakia's character too, and if you know anything about the comics, Nakia's character actually was a turncoat. So after she was, uh, her affections were uh, thrown aside by T'Challa, she ended up becoming a villain. And they turn that all on its head in the movie, which is amazing, because you get this powerful character who, uh, next to Okoye, is able to give us a representation of how people within the Wakanda are really managing this idea of being sequestered from the rest of the world when all of this uh, travesty has happened throughout the diaspora. Um, so I feel like I could talk about that for a while. But the third point I wanted to bring up that was just felt important to me um, and I say it again with the caveat of not one movie can solve all of what we need or provide all of what we need. Um, I wonder about the diversity that lies underneath. Um, we know that in the comics, there is a lesbian relationship between um, one of the soldiers and another of the soldiers, which is really amazing. The, what's not amazing is that it's so unique. And what's also not amazing is it doesn't appear in the movie. Um, and I, I've read, I read a lot of articles because I was nervous about today, and I'm like, I'm not an intellectual, I don't think of myself this way, so I'm like, how do I sound smart too? Um, <laughs> so I'm reading the articles, and I'm a little disappointed because I think we all have this sense of like, no, 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 that, this is my movie. Don't criticize my movie. You know, you're rubbing the magic off of it. It's so powerful. Um, and I think if any of us know, especially from the Obama administration, Holding the things that we value to a high standard is not devaluing them. And so we can ask more of Black Panther, particularly because we know there's going to be a sequel, and there may even been, be a spinoff with Akoye, which would be amazing. I just want to see her pull off the wig. Like, everything is great. <laughs> like, I gay boyed throughout the entire movie. It was amazing. <laughs> um, it, was just, it was super exciting. And I think, because I'm going to just go off into a tangent. It was exciting to me, mostly because I related to a lot of the female characters. I related to T'Challa because of the sense of responsibility, because I'm like, you know what, I feel that way in my job. I'm responsible, I didn't get knighted, I'm not the mayor of gay town, like, I'm here as responsible for my community that doesn't get a lot of visibility. Um, and that's, that's a weight. Um, but then I feel excited by the movement of the women in the movie. Um, I think the one exception I think to that is M'Baku, because not only is M'Baku really hot, but he's really like, he's still playing by the same rules and there's this strong brotherhood there, is that there's a conflict where in the beginning I can still vie for the crown, but I didn't get it, you know, no hard feelings, I'm gonna go back to the mountain, and we're still all playing by the rules even though there's beef. And I'm like, that's really amazing. Because in any other movie, you would think there would be a backstabbing black man who's ready to just take the carpet out from the king just so he could have the power. 
We have no characters like that. But I digress, because this has nothing to do with my third point. Um, that was so exciting about how black men treated each other. And even for his best friend, who betrayed him, had a very good reason for doing it that was wrapped up in emotion. Which if I sit and think about it, I'm like, wow, Killmonger was about emotion too. His best friend was about emotion. Tatala with his father was about emotion. I'm like, wow, we had a lot of emotional men in here. That's kind of exciting. Um, I mean, I wish it were more explicit, obviously, but you know, make it a series so that we can get more of that. Um, I think to wrap up my last point after that large uh, tangent, um, I wonder what diversity is underneath what we were able to see of Wakanda. Um, in a community that was untouched by colonization, um, that could give us some of the answers and reflections of the true history of LGBTness, what we would call LGBTness and queerness in Africa, um, pre-colonial Africa, what would that have evolved into and what would that have looked like? Um, what kind of partnerships, what kind of diversity of intimacy would we, would we see? You know, what happens if capitalism doesn't exist and our bodies aren't currency? What happens if we don't have um, kind of a, a crusader Christian view of uh, mor morals and mores imposed upon African people? What does that look like? So in some ways, it just leaves me wanting so much more of the story of Wakanda. Um, but it makes me excited because whether or not we get it, it's inspired so many people to build Wakanda now. So even with like the WakandaCon, I'm excited to see what people build in the United States to reflect what their aspirations are. So I don't know what minute I'm at, but it feels like 10 minutes. So I'm going to stop. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you to Dr. Carruthers and Quincy uh, for this invitation to be with you tonight. Um, I want to start off by saying that we're here because as a community, we made Black Panther into something that Marvel could not have imagined. Right? That this has become a community phenomenon for us, in addition to a global one. And as you rightly mentioned, there are many critiques of the film. Oftentimes, what I've noticed in many of the commentaries, um, much of the disappointment is because the film doesn't easily map onto our identity politics the way in which we want it to. Right? So what I want to do is just talk briefly about three virtues that we can take out of Black Panther, right, given its global significance. And the first is that given that Black Panther has now cracked the top 10 grossing films of all time, because we were going to see it two and three times, right? <laughs> but that to not underestimate the way in which popular culture offers religious and moral explanations right, to societies that have grown increasingly disconnected from traditional religious traditions. Right? And so by contrast, if you look at Star Wars, right, Star Wars gave you a representation, an image of what evil is. And that image was the stormtrooper, taken right out of Nazi Germany. Right? It has given you an explanation for why the world is messed up. Right? But what Black Panther does, it says, no, if you want to know why the world is the way it is, you've got to go further into colonialism. So Black Panther gives us a more important story of origin for our situation. The second virtue, as Dr. Carruthers has already mentioned, is the question of worldviews. Oftentimes, you see movies like Avatar, and the non-European people, they image them as having a wonderful, beautiful culture, and then they get slaughtered. Right? The Europeans have all the science and technology, and we've got all the mysticism. Where in Black Panther, you have our deep religious and cultural, spiritual tradi traditions integrated with science and technology. So you got the spear on the one hand, right, and vibranium weapons on the other. Right? You got Shuri's laboratory in which she looks at your spine, as well as being able to go out and look at plants that give you superpowers. Right? The engagement with the ancestors. This is a kind of Afrofuturistic vision that we need for our time. Right? The third is coming to terms with our pain. 
Right? Killmonger's pain is our pain. Right? So I don't think that for me, it's not helpful to say, are you with Killmonger or are you against him? Rather, the point is to understand him. And to look at what he represents in, in all of its complexities. Right? And part of what I appreciate about what the film does is at the end, although Killmonger dies, the original vision in some sense survives. Because right? he convinces T'Challa, the world needs you. Right? And to really think about that tension between black self-determination and how that can lead into isolationism. So when the film ends with T'Challa at the UN, I actually appreciate that scene. Right? Because what it says is the world doesn't need just vibranium. The world needs Wakandan spirituality and culture right, to guide those resources. Empires are concerned with global stability, but I believe God is calling us to global sustainability. Right? And so to think about what kind of global institutions do we need to begin thinking about that kind of vision. Also, on, on a personal note, um, I appreciate that the, the director and the producers of Black Panther were intentional about bringing certain kinds of images and practices from a wide variety of African cultures. Uh, there was a time in my life when I inhabited what I call a vulgar Afrocentricity, right? masquerading really as a kind of Egyptology. Right? <laughs> uh, but when I went to Ghana, right, it changed everything for me. I had to come to terms with the real depth and complexity right, of the continent and this particular nation. So when I came back, I had to come to terms not just with, I had to come to terms with my Americanness. Right? And to begin understanding what Zero Neil Hurston said that I'm a not I'm not a tragic Negro. Right? <laughs> Let's embrace both this particular history we have in this country as well as a diasporic consciousness. Right? And to think about what that means and right? how we can continue to build relationships of solidarity. And, and I tell my students this all the time, too often we assume solidarity instead of building it. We've got to work really hard to think about what a diasporic form of solidarity looks like. So I'll end there. Thank you. I almost feel like I should be just sitting in the audience. Um, <laughs> thank you for the comments. I want to thank Quincy for uh, the invitation, as well as Tanya for the connection uh, to be here tonight, uh, as well as the other panelists who are yet to speak, and I'm very conscious of that. Um, I think that uh, I bring the perspective of, as a first generation Igbo woman from Southeast, what is called Nigeria, having grown up largely here, but with most of my family still back home, what we still consider home, and having straddled multiple cultural experiences, um, and having grown up in a context that was very much rooted in who we are as Igbo people, uh, with the understanding that when you step outside the door, you can be American, but in here, we're Igbo, and what that means. And so that's the lens that I came to um, watching this film. And it was quite refreshing for me on a number of points. I think just a couple of things that I think are useful for us to dissect, and it's actually just in listening to some of the things that have been said and wanting to um, respond to those things. One is just the lens through which we view ourselves and the notion of identity. Uh, whether we are on the continent or whether we are here in the United States or elsewhere in the diaspora, one of the most critical questions that stood out to me was the scene in the movie where uh, Killmonger was asked the question, who are you? Tell them who you are. Tell them who you are, your identity. And though he had been born 
in Oakland, and though he had been reared largely as an American, when he heard that question, he immediately switched to his language and stated who he was. It was still rooted in him. And in the broader context, to me, it was this notion of even living in the United States, having been born here, being in the diaspora elsewhere around the world, there's something about being African that never goes away. And all too often, we have these chasms, they're imaginary chasms that divide us as though we're separated from that root. But anyone who's traveled, and I've had the privilege of traveling pretty much everywhere, and wherever you see black people, there's something unique about that connection that does not occur with other ethnicities or other races. Everywhere from Uzbekistan to Slovakia to Argentina to Chicago to when we see each other, there's something that binds us that I don't even know if we're really conscious of how powerful that thing is. But what it means is that we cannot afford to adopt a narrative that creates this notion of separation because we have the same root. And that root is our identity. The second point uh, for me is about how we view ourselves in the context of how we're situated in the universe. And the adoption of a narrative that's premised on oppression and my rejecting that premise as understanding our history beyond our American history, but the history of who we were as Africans. The language that we use is very powerful. So even the term white supremacy I call it white pathology. Yes. Because there's an implication about the word supremacy that's false. Yes. Absolutely. In the context in which it's used. Yes. It's a pathology that is a destructive force that adopts a philosophy like capitalism that cannot coexist in the natural in a way that's symbiotic, that seeks to conquer and dominate. That's a pathology. And if we understand our cultures originally and our spirituality, it's premised on the notion of balance and harmony, the interconnectedness of all things, and our ability to live within the context of the natural in harmony. So the outlier is everything that is against that. So when you look at what happens with the environment, not caring about the environment, with this notion of even this notion of a separation between the creator and those that are created. At least from my cultural background and spirituality, that was a very strange thing. And so how we talk about ourselves determines our trajectory. How we view ourselves determines our trajectory. So if we only talk about ourselves through the lens of oppression, we condition ourselves to be oppressed. Um, I don't see Black Panther as Afrofuturism, I see it as accurate history. I see it as who we are and were without Western interference. I see the connection between technology and spirituality as natural, because we were doing it before the introduction of guns and other destructive uh, tools. This notion of tolerance and how we coexist. We have a saying in, in, and actually it's two final points that I think are crucial to this conversation. One is the notion of tolerance, right? And how we coexist, and this is to the, the question earlier about the differences, whether you're different sexual orientation, different phenotype, all of that. In our culture, in Igbo culture, we have a saying, ebe bere ugo bere. Ebe bere ugo bere. It means let the bird and the kite share the same branch. Mm -hmm. Basically, live and let live. That we know that there are differences amongst us. That you might have a different sexual orientation, you might look different, you might sound different, but we occupy the same branch and we do so in harmony because we respect that we are. And so in societies, prior to the introduction of Christianity 
and even Islam, there was already an understanding of tolerance. We didn't have to be told uh, that you are human because your difference didn't make you less human than I or anyone else. We also had this notion, at least in our society, which is very democratic, that the Igbo don't have kings. So we were truly democratic, meaning everyone is on the same plane, that we all occupy space on this planet, that no one is above, that no one should be subservient in the broadest sense of the word. So this notion of tolerance. The other thing that stood out to me was this was the first time I've ever seen in film a more accurate representation of the role of men and women in our society. Um, here, I, growing up in the United States, I, it was interesting to me because I, we believe that there are roles for men and women in society. They just have to be balanced. So men are different than women, and that's fine. And so my accepting of those gender roles, I was called uh, in, in college, actually, uh, I was in a gender and women's studies class, and they, they gasped, and like, oh, you're so oppressed. I mean, you just don't know what's going on. I said, huh? <laughs> I said, it works very well. So we have the men, we call the council of men, the umunna. We also have a council of women, umwada. When the men make decisions and have their conversations, if they can't come to an agreement, they go to umada, and whatever they say, that's what they adopt. It's that kind of balance. So we recognize that our roles are necessary to create harmony and balance in our society. And so for me to see strong women, knowing that in our lineage, in my lineage, it was women that started the women's war, the first uprising against the British Empire on the continent, started in my father's village. And that wasn't a strange thing, because women have always been engaged, have always participated in the economy, were never seen as second class. It wasn't, quite frankly, until the introduction of Christianity, and specifically Western Christianity, that we began to adopt these patriarchal notions of who's valued and who's not, and these notions of gender, where one gender is more valuable and has a prized position than the other, right? So, Seeing the Dora Milaje and seeing women who it wasn't a thing for them to be strong and to be in leadership was the first time I've seen in film in this country a more accurate representation of what the women's role on the continent has always been. And so I think just in my closing comments, what this movie does is it opens up a space for us to critically reflect on who we believe that we are, who we say that we are, and also recognizing that it's not so much that we have to create something new. A lot of it is actually just rediscovering our history and actually believing that maybe we had some things right. And what does that look like, to stand on that unapologetically? Well, I don't really have a, a three-point um, presentation here, but I'll, I'll tell you how I uh, uh, approached the, the topic was to think about what was what my real takeaways from the movie, and um, and I thought about deeply the the spirituality of of, of Black Panther. And what, what, what struck me is that black people have always been very spiritual uh, and religious even, but, but, but very spiritual, very much connected to the spirit. And that was apparent to me in many ways uh, in the movie. But particularly I was struck by the, 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 the cross-fisted, bosom-heaving prayer that people uh, would do when they were cheering someone on or, or, or uh, attempting to 
to uh, call the divine power to, to, to help. And I, I actually began doing that when I, was, uh, when I got home. And it's actually very efficacious. It's efficacious in a way that, you know, you are embodying the fervency of your, uh, uh, your request uh, to, the, to the spirit. And, and I just, that was very powerful for me in a, in, in a profound way. Of, of course, also, there's the, the, uh, the reach back to the ancestors. That is also part of the, the, uh, the, the implication of the spirit or the, the, uh, the imbrication of the spirit throughout the movie. And I, I, I love that, of course. Uh, but there was something else that, that I almost missed. Because in our culture, the spirit of murder is normalized. So I almost missed that. Uh, uh, the obvious person to, to look at is Killmonger. The name is actually I think, representative of African Americans, particularly. It's, it's, it's a collective name for us. And, and, uh, but that's not the only thing that I, where I saw this spirit of murder that, that, that goes right past us. I also saw it in the, uh, the glib uh, shooting down of of the the the, uh, the aircraft that were trying to escape Wakanda in order to take the weapons with them, the, the, just shoot them down, just like video games shooting shooting them down, and we just forget about that people are dying, that people are are losing their lives in this, in this, uh, we just don't even think about murder. It's so normalized in our experience. And, uh, and, and I, part of the reason I say that Killmonger is representative in a way that critiques African Americans particularly is that we, I, I'm not even sure whether we're mature enough to receive the critique. And, to, and to, to look at the ways in which we just, uh, we, we normalize these things, we adjust to these things, and we don't uh, uh, feel the, 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 the need to, to self-regulate in terms of how we're building our cultural uh, images and such, and, and, our, and our cultural um, uh, output, uh, Murder, Inc., uh, Death Row, uh, just, just normalizing the stuff. But not only uh, normalizing murder, we're normalizing uh, 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 abusive sex. We're just normalizing that, in, and, and I, I wonder, can we receive that critique? Of, uh, I, I had a conversation with some folk about trap music and the way in which it normalizes the abuse of girls. Or, and and, uh, and I, I feel very strongly about that because my, I have an 18-year-old daughter, and girls from 16 to 19 are the most vulnerable but we normalize this stuff. It's okay because it sounds good, and it's okay to dance to, and it's okay to. Uh, it's especially okay if we particularly feel safe. And but many girls are not. They are just not. But we're normalizing this. And I felt that the movie tried to bring some of that to our attention too in the very beginning when it uh, demonstrates the girls being trafficked mm -hmm. and and the, their rescue. And how, how, do we, how do we exchange a spirit of normalizing stuff that should not be to a spirit of, of valuing every person and, and, and not missing uh, the way in which 
murder, the taking of human life is just so, uh, it's a glib thing that we take for granted that is going to happen uh, uh, with or without our uh, intervention, with or without our uh, calling it to the attention of, 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 of uh, our church members and, and our communities and, and such, uh, without having some kind of responsibility for turning that ship around. So I, I, I don't, certainly uh, there's lots of spirituality in the movie. And maybe murder isn't a spirit, but it certainly evokes a spiritual uh, uh, crisis, awareness, a spiritual uh, um, necessity of 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 uh, reclaiming something of the the real value of folk, and 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 making that primary in our uh, way we do theology, in the way we uh, do our activism, making that a primary thing that 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 people know that they are they are somebody that they have somebodyness, and that that matters ultimately. So that's, that's all I have to say. Check, 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 check. Um, thanks for having me. And I'm going to piggyback off of what was just said um, in the context of normalizing things that we shouldn't normalize. And when, um, one part of Black Panther that I think was ref a reflection of normalizing trends and narratives that shouldn't be normalized is this narrative that's been pushed that things that arise in our culture or arise in nature or maybe philosophies that our leaders um, may express, we usually have a narrative that says they can't coexist or um, that they have to be at odds with each other or that we have to choose one. And um, I've seen this in Black Panther in the context of Killmonger getting all the way to Wakanda and not being able to stay. And um, basically, he was in a, a, had an ultimatum. It was either you can be a part of this culture and be controlled or feel controlled or feel like he couldn't be his individual self and not express himself to some extent. Or he could die. And in the case of Black Panther, he died. And that was my main critique of the movie because um, in a creative space, in, in Afrofuturism, you can create your own narrative. I didn't, if I created it, I would have created it so that Killmonger could live. Um, the movie made me think about advanced technology and advanced intellectualism. For example, you see the trains and the vibranium and the wonderful technology they have, and then you have the spiritual side. And um, like the other panelists said, they really coexist. You can't just have the technology and not the spiritual aspects. But that whole context made me think of advanced intelligence as it um, concerns emotional intelligence. Uh, Black Panthers, the Black Panther knew that there was a child, or his dad knew there was a child. The people within Wakanda knew there was a child in America and knew why he was left there. They knew there was a murder committed. And a lot of emotional intelligence could have been gained from that, that they could learn from and come up with a way to embrace uh, Killmonger whenever he did make it back to Wakanda. But instead, they ran from the secret. They had internal issues. And it came back to visit them and almost tore down the whole kingdom. So, um, and I just see this all the time in the, the main narrative that the media put out. Like, you either can have Malcolm or Martin or Newton or Cle uh, Eldridge. So uh, that was basically my main critique. But it also made me think of advanced technology as it comes to biological technology and how we perceive advanced technology. Because again, we've seen the trains, but we also seen the scarification on Killmonger and the different ways that um, African culture was represented and the paradigm shift 
that you get when you get into Wakanda. And specifically, not really even, the people outside of Wakanda didn't know about the technology that was within or um, the different dresses, the lip plates, the, the dressing that was on the neck, all of that had relevance. It wasn't just decoration. In a sense, that's technology too. And it uh, serves as great, as, a per as great a purpose as a fast moving train or a, a suit that absorbs bullets. And it's more, in my opinion, it's more important than those physical manifestations. Um, it also made me think of magic and mysticism and how we speak about it like it's foreign to us, but when we speak about our ancestors, we speak of them as if it's something that's indigenous to them. And we sometimes separate ourselves. I think that's a part of the separation that, um, that we internalize, thinking that we can break away from the root. Um, but for example, Black Panther represents the connection between America and Africa. Well, the African and American connection, because in Africa, you, got the ja you have the um, leopard. In America, you have the jaguar. There's no jaguars in Africa, no leopards in America. But the dominating characteristics of the Black Panther is that it's a black cat. And in Africa, that, um, that black coat that you will find on a leopard is a recessive gene. In America, it's a dominant gene. But it's a connecting piece in the illustration of the spirituality that we can't be disconnected from. So um, definitely made me think about us embracing our own mysticism and spirituality and having a paradigm shift in the favor of ourselves where we don't see these um, characteristics and benefits of embracing these natural aspects of existence as foreign and see them as innate or inherent. So um, we can move forward off that because one thing that the media has done is demonize our own spirituality or indigenous spiritualities. Like they had a whole campaign to make voodoo seem like it's um, the de devil worship or um, really all things involved when it comes to um, indigenous spirituality, AKA African spirituality, AKA human spirituality. Um, that's definitely one of the main things that stuck out to me is that we are almost dealing with a double consciousness and often it's not in our favor. The spiritual aspects of it aren't in our favor. And um, it's definitely, um, Black Panther is definitely good for exposing the audience to the diversity in spirituality within Africa with the ancestors representing themselves in all kinds of different ways. And also the, um, the different distinctions between everyone that was a part of Wakanda. But one thing I didn't see was them embracing Killmonger. Um, for such a place to be so diverse and to encompass so many aspects of spirituality and to have people um, that, aren't, that disagree but can still work together in this richness of culture and you know Killmonger exists and he get all the way back there and it's, he can jump off a cliff or he can uh, live a life that's unsatisfying to me for Afrofuturism. That's not, um, um, that's, it's, it's not impressive, put it that way. And when you have a blank canvas to create your own narrative, uh, what's her name? Um, Octavia Butler said you have to write yourself in. And as far as the African American um, identity that that movie illustrates, um, that's not good for me. Because I'm not jumping off a cliff <laughs> and I'm not getting all the way to Wakanda just to be um, unfulfilled or unsatisfied. And I feel like as creatives, we, can, we have the opportunity to own that narrative and not accept the narrative, like you said, that accept the narrative that's to our disadvantage or a disservice. To me, that was a disservice. Yes. I'm not convinced Killmonger is actually dead. Me neither. <laughs> 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 you know, in, the comics, in the comic book, Killmonger actually gets resurrected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that that's what they're going to put in the sequel. But. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, if you're really geeky, there's um, a lot of fan art that's reconciled it. Wow. Where you have, I mean, if you've ever seen like the comedy of um, 
Obama's angry side, like behind him <laughs> yelling what he's actually thinking. They've done a lot of that where like T'Challa's in front of the podium, but Killmonger's saying what he's really thinking. And he, it's always presented as Killmonger's his, uh, most loyal and closest advisor. Mm. So I like that even as you're saying, like write yourself in, like mm -hmm. even with this, this fantasy media, we can again just layer over and say, no, we actually would prefer if he lived. We'd exactly. actually prefer if he reconciled. <laughs> yeah. And he can still be angry. Uh -huh. And to your point, what you said about women earlier, from what I was reading in the earlier com uh, comic book, when the asteroid fell with vibranium in it, it had an element in it that um, made them turn into demons. And um, it, was a, um, it wasn't a good reaction. So the only thing that the king, a leader, could do at that time was um, ask the mother goddess for, for assistance, which is represented in Black Panther um, as the um, Egyptian goddess, I believe her name is Beset. And um, that's when they come across the plant, which has the um, ability to process the mineral that was making them turn into demons and therefore make them be able to um, link with her and then have those Black Panther powers. But I'll say that because there's a definite connect to women and maybe not a queen, but a goddess, you know, same status and same That's ability. a really good point, yeah. yeah. Well, it turns out the evening has moved along rather rapidly, so we only get the chance to ask one question each from the moderators. So I want to be, remind you of what Lerone Bennett said. I guess that was about, what, uh, 40, 50 years ago. He said the images, he's, the line was, image fields, image sees, image fields, image acts. What that meant was the images that we see influence how we feel and ultimately how we act. Since he stated that, neuroscience has come along with this discovery of something called mirror neurons that sort of explains how we begin to respond to the things that we perceive. Sight, sound, taste, smell, whatever. We have a direct correlation to what we perceive and how we behave. We go back to Dr. Terrell's point, right? And what you gave us was a solid example of how you were able to leave the theater and use this movie as a reference point, right? For your practice of petitioning down the Holy Spirit. We take that as one example, and we have to ask ourselves, what other examples can we identify where we can begin to integrate Right, the goodness of the movie. You raised, you made, a, you made a statement that's really quite interesting and frightening. You said you don't know if we have the maturity to effectively critique this work. That applies to many texts that we see. We we don't do that, so we we need to do that. I only have opportunity for one question, so that's mine. Okay. What kinds of things can we get out of this movie to use it and apply it in daily life? I, I, think, I think one of the things that I hope we get out of the movie uh, that we, I think, might have been overlooked, and I think Dr. Terrell did a good job of pointing this out, is the violence towards women that was understated but also overstated at the same time. Uh, to point out one quick thing about that original scene, when uh, T'Challa is dropping out of the, uh, uh, the Black Panther mobile, uh, from the Black Panther mobile down to stop and save Nakia. Remember the focus of his mission was to save Nakia, not to save the rest of the sisters. And so a lot of times what happens in our practical uh, understandings of how, what women to save, we want to save Nakia, but forget about the rest of the sisters on the bus. So we elevate Felicia Rashad and shame Cardi B. And, and so I, I think that there is this need for us to see that every woman on that truck was worthy to be saved. Uh, and, and another thing about the violence towards women that I hope we catch is that a lot of folk, as much as we identify with Killmonger and his rage and his anger, uh, there's something to note that in Killmonger's quest for freedom, the people that he hurt the most were black women. So his quote-unquote girlfriend at the beginning. We don't know his relationship to her. 
But in order for him to get free, he shoots her in the head. Uh, when he gets to Wakanda, uh, he chokes the mother that's uh, over the vibranium. When it comes to them fighting in that final scene, he slits the throat of the sister that says Wakanda forever. And a lot of times when we look at, uh, as I'm going to call them, patriarchal hoteps uh, that like to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the roots of, of Africanity but deny the power they, they're in, are always willing to put black women on the, uh, the altar of black liberation. And what needs to be say, stated is all these folk that are defending Bill Cosby that are trying to make excuses for Bill Cosby, make excuses for Nas because we like Illmatic, try to make excuses for Kanye West, make excuses for all these brothers that put black women on the altar of black liberation. Uh, and, and, and I really want us to critique, as much as I, I, I appreciate Killmonger, we got to look at the way that African people in America have, have put black women uh, as subsidiaries to black liberation, as if it wasn't black women that created the first black churches, as if it wasn't black women that created uh, all of the things. That, it, it's always been black women that have carried uh, the movements uh, for liberation. And so what I'm hoping... Uh, to your uh, brilliant question, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Allen, is that we take out of it as brothers, and I don't know if this was uh, set up like this on purpose for the sisters and brothers to be segregated on, on stage. I, I, I ain't had nothing to do with this. Don't put me on Twitter like this. Uh, but if there's anything that we as brothers can take from this is to own our patriarchy, own our sexism, own our homo and transphobia, and say, I'm not going to put another aspect of Wakanda on the altar. Uh, of black liberation so that I can be free because uh, the, the reality of Ubuntu is that I am because we are uh, and, and if we are willing to put black women on the altar uh, of black liberation we're not free we become the same colonizer we're trying to fight I think I would like to respond to that to that question about the importance of cultural tradition and practice um, the succession plan for Black Panther was this fight or this wrestling um, and whomever won was the new Black Panther. And it, there was a part in the movie, so I guess the point for me is that there are traditions that we had that have value. Understanding that cultures are dynamic so they naturally change, but in every culture that is sustainable, and that, uh, that works, there are cultural norms and practices that are passed down from generation to generation. This is not to say that everything in the past is good and we have to do it and it never changes, but it's to say that to create order in a society requires the adherence of some set of cultural practices that can be passed down from generation to generation. And what we see, what I see, is a breakdown in the passage of those cultural norms. Everything from how young boys become men, how girls become women, how you establish yourself as a leader in the community. There are certain things that you had to do that were collectively accepted as necessary to take your place in society. And when you have a breakdown, you have disrespect of elders. You have communities where grandmas get shot on their porches. You have situations where young people who've never seen their parents put on something to go to work who now have never adopted the culture of work. I think that we have to be honest about what is happening in our culture and what we are passing down from generation to generation that can create the kind of stability that we need to advance as a collective. And I will point out one particular part in the movie when Killmonger came back to claim his place. And the mom, Angela Bassett, the queen, she was wrong. She tried to say, well, he has no space here because she was mad. Mm -hmm. Well, in a culture that is guided by practices and traditions and order, she had to be checked. Because if you don't check the aberration, it leads to chaos. Right. And so Killmonger was actually in the right and coming back to claim the, the crown, no matter how we feel about who he was. And he sought to go through the process. And those sorts of checks and balances, especially in communal societies, which African societies were communal. They were based on the collective. It wasn't this individualism. You had these cultural norms in place so that there could be order. 
And so I think here, what we can pull from the movie is we look in our neighborhoods. For me, this is about our neighborhoods. I think about restorative justice. I think about a neighborhood without police. And what does that look like if we haven't established the cultural norms that can guarantee that when I need someone to come to my rescue, I have someone that I can call that's not a police officer. So how do we rebuild that? How do we recreate that? We can do it. Sure, I'm asking too. <laughs> but it's a good question. <laughs> Something for us to, to think about. So um, I think how we reclaim the ancestors is we acknowledge our ancestors, call out their names. Um, and I think acknowledgement is key. And it's more simple than we might. We could complicate it, but it, I think it's real simple. It's as simple as acknowledging and loving one another. And we know that um, we know it's a spiritual realm beyond this, and they have names. And if you don't have their names, it's another way to grasp them. But um, I think it, acknowledgement is key. We're talking about reclaiming the ancestors. I think step one step, one initial step, is to begin digging into our own family tree. Right? We often want to claim ancestors without even knowing our own family history. And we can't leave it up to Ancestry.com and these other kits that you can purchase, right? And they give you some statistic that you're 15% this. No, we actually have to begin embodying our own history and tracing back and doing that work. And I think as a cultural practice, right, that's something that we have to really reclaim. And I just want to mention one thing to the question regarding can we receive critiques? Uh, one thing I appreciate about Black Panther was the way in which Killmonger and T'Challa critique one another. Right? I think Killmonger, the particular, is the African-American experience, but the global relevance is that um, movements of resistance can often come to embody the very things that they're trying to uh, push against. Right? And so T'Challa has a right critique of Killmonger. Right, that just because your movement is rooted in your pain does not mean that it's about critique. Likewise, for Killmonger to critique T'Challa and for him to say to the ancestors in a scene that you're wrong, wow. I was like, I was in the movie like, did he just say mm -hmm. to the ancestors that they were wrong? <laughs> right, I mean, right. <laughs> so that <laughs> together, that, that kind of mutual critique of one another, that's a cultural practice. Right, but you can't critique something that you are not a part of, that you don't appreciate, that you don't love. So it's a critique rooted in love and an affirmation of who we are. Yes. You know, I think, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. You can go ahead. Um, okay, I'll no, go. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, I was thinking about, you said how to connect to the ancestors. And um, in the movie, they would eat that heart-shaped plant and they could go to the ancestral realm, which seems very science fiction-y, but if you study some indigenous cultures of South America or just shamans and their practices, there really are plants that can connect you or help you to communicate with the ancestral realm, and that is a reality and it's been studied. And like a plant like ayahuasca can help you. Has anybody heard of ayahuasca? Okay, a couple of people, and what y'all heard was probably that it can help you connect to the spiritual realm. I just wanted to point that out because Black Panther did illustrate that uh, the whole nature of that, and as far as par paradigm shifts go, you can do that in real life. May I just say that books can also help you connect to the ancestors. <laughs> 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 because our ancestors, we have, we have a very rich intellectual history. All of the intellectual uh, controversies in Christianity were formulated in Africa. They weren't formulated somewhere else. And they were rooted in concern for the whole uh, communal experience. The idea of infant baptism and the necessity of that is, it was, was a, it, an African question. Uh, and and the, the, the Montanist movement, which was the, the first kind of uh, 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 charismatic movement was, was shaped by Tertullian, who was from Carthage in Africa. So, uh, so, so, but we have books, 
and we have books from long ago, and we have books that are recent, and, and they help us to connect to our intellectual, because to, to me, the intellect is part of the spirit, is part of what motivates us, is part, and, and part of our problem is that we don't know how smart we are. Amen. We, we don't know how smart we are, we don't know how spiritual we are. We, oh, uh, because we just take for granted that, you know, I say something and you have no idea how deep that was what you just said. My, 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 my daughter said to me the other day, she said, I just let God and go. Now you know the real saying is let go and let God, but she said, I let God and go. And I'm still unpacking that. <laughs> respect our own uh, intellectual heritage. And, and that's part of our uh, uh, way back to our ancestors, too. Uh, you know, it, 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 it makes me think. I, I'm having a lot of simultaneous emotions, I think, because it reminds me of some of the work that I want our organization, Chicago Black Women's Caucus, to, to take. Um, it is really easy for us not to give ourselves enough credit. Um, <laughs> to not give ourselves enough credit um, for the work that we do and the intellects that we have. Um, but that's because the, um, the battle against racism is a steep mm -hmm. battle. Um, and it makes me think of the work that we have as community leaders in alleviating just the, the, the mountain of work it takes an individual to somehow weave through the curated histories that we're given to get to the mountain of history that's available to us. And then after that, be able to absorb it and to come out with your own conclusions in the 21st century. Um, I think particularly for black LGBTQ people, I say, well, you know, there is a sense with every generation that is the first generation almost, is that we have a sense of what happened. I mean, HIV hit my community so hard that I don't have a lot of elders to look to. Um, and that some of my history in, in the part of the community that I occupy is, has passed. Um, and that means that we have a lot of work to do to uncover it. And that mirrors the struggle that we have just as black people in general. Um, a lot of us have, have died unnecessarily. And I, I don't know if I can make a bigger understatement, you know? Um, but I know that we had vibrant, thriving communities 100 years ago. I mean, black LGBT people 100 years ago. We had speakeasies, we had ways to commune with each other, we had ways to, um, to say, well, you know what, there's not enough space for us here. How do we make our own spaces? Um, I think particularly when, you're, when we're talking about order, I was like, no, tear it all down! <laughs> um, because I'm used to living in, in communities and the world that's not prepared for me, and communities and world that doesn't have space for me. And so I'm tempted to tear it down in a way like Killmonger almost, because there's no space. Um, the alternative is to go even further back and to say, well, wait, spaces were created, but they were taken away. And if I think really clearly, I say, well, actually, I'm a little disturbed. Because the only way that I know what's going on with my community is if my family talks about it, my friends talk about it, I see it on TV, or I see it on my phone. If it doesn't exist in those areas, or any kind of media that I'm absorbing, then it might as well not exist in my reality. And what a scary thing, because it's so easy for those things not to talk about my histories. Um, and I almost use this around a black LGBT experience because, again, it mirrors our larger experience as a black community in saying, well, what were, what was the diversity of what we would call queer identity in pre-colonial Africa? Where was the space for every body in the community to not be thought of as being uh, worth more or worth less? It's almost hard for me to conceptualize what that means because I'm so conditioned to being in a, in a society where 
you know, I hear about people that I know being assaulted because they are thought of as less than or not belonging in a certain community. Um, and if I think too hard about it, I'm disturbed. And so I almost want to run away from it because it just hurts too much. Um, but it is our responsibility as, as royalty, I guess, you know, this version of royalty that's yes. about service and responsibility yes. to know that that's really hard for the individual to absorb and to learn without getting a degree in African American studies. Um, that it's our responsibility to, to help in the curation so that our people have access to the information about our past. Can I just add, I think what you just shared really is a, a charge to those of us who work in seminaries. Right? Uh, we graduate people who are supposed to know a lot about ritual right, and worship and what it means to call things into remembrance. Right? So what would it mean for the community that you just talked about to be a part of our communal remembrance and to be ritualized in the context of worship? Right? And something that when we talk about connecting with ancestors, even to this day, I'll never forget a sermon that connected uh, our understanding of the ancestors with the transfiguration of Christ. Right? The idea of Moses and Elijah are here, right? In a way in which they connected that to, from, from, a, from an African sensibility, right? So I think there's a particular charge to, to what, you've, uh, what you've said, that uh, those of us who teach in seminaries and in religious spaces, we ought to be graduating people who have the capacity to begin connecting us to our ancestors. Hmm. We have a lot of work to do. We do. <laughs> I, I think to echo really quickly something that Dr. Terrell said uh, in terms of graduating people from our seminaries who are in tune with our ancestors, they need to be reading books and writings and articles that our ancestors wrote. Because if I'm going to learn history of Christian thought uh, and the only books that I'm exposed to are those written by folk who don't share my lineage, I'm going to be tapped into other ancestors uh, and I will be uh, theologically, uh, theologically confused. Uh, and, and, and so I think at the same breath that we are in preaching classes and we're reading Charles Spurgeon and we don't just need to just go to Gardner Taylor and because they, they were important. But at the end of the day, you also got Carter G. Woodson, Negro or, orators in their orations throughout. And he writes this whole book of, of just black folk talking about stuff. The entire journal of Negro history that the, uh, that the Association for the Study of, uh, in Life, uh, the study of, 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 of Negro or now African-American life and history, just stuff that. Carter G. Woodson just basically sent an APB out to all black folk around the country. Send in the stuff you got in your attic. This is what black folk were thinking. We don't just need to have the representative thinkers, the people that we approve of, but just random black aunties and uncles and cousins and nephews that are writing at the, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century folk that are, just, that are just thinking, black folk that are just thinking, not just the ones that we like to quote. I know I quoted both Carter G. Woodson and W.E.B. Du Bois because we like to quote them, but also... You got, you got Anna G. U. Cooper. You got these sisters that are writing, that are thinking, that are producing information. You got uh, Hubert Harrison. You got all these folk that are just thinking, but they're not included in a seminary syllabus, syllabi. We need to be reading Joanne Terrell's uh, This Power in the Blood. We need to be reading uh, uh, In Search of Their Mother's Gardens. We need to be reading these things, but, they, but if we're not exposed to this, and this is one of my biggest beats. This is why I had to leave CTS, and I went to Princeton and left Princeton for the same reason, is I can't be in touch with ancestors that you won't let me talk to. I talk to the books. Whenever you read a book, you're talking to it. You're having a conversation with the author. And if we are, if we are only having conversations with people who are invested or silent about our oppression, then we'll just be in conversation uh, with ourselves. And, and until we are able to, in the words of, of the late great Jacob Carruthers, uh, until we are able to disconnect ourselves from the need of having European translators, and being able to speak to our own legacy, our own lineage, because they spoke too. 
We, we didn't stop speaking. Africa didn't stop going into existence after 1619. Black folk in Africa were writing. We were thinking. Shake off the joke. We were thinking. Ain't had nothing to do with anything American. We were thinking. We were talking. We were writing. And we need to be so in love with our history that it's not just enough for us to put on Kente when we go to see the movie. But we put on Kente in our mind and we're reading what our people were saying because we've been talking. We've been talking, and, 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 and it's one of the things that really gets me riled up because we have this temporal blackness. We have this blackness that is cute to put on. It's like how in the early 90s, McDonald's had Kente in all their commercials because, you know, black folk was listening to Sounds of Blackness. The Quincy Jones was coming out with Soulful Celebration. It was cute to be black. And right now, we're at a place where it's cute to be black and woke, but it's, it's temporal, it's superficial. We need to be able to disabuse ourselves of, of, of the need to be accepted and approved in what the accepted and approved blackness looks like. But I'm talking about black in your mind. I'm talking about so, so wrapped up in trying to find the voices of your ancestors that they start to speak through your mouth. But our audience members have questions. So in the interest of time, because it is Friday night, and we know y'all want to go home as much as you want to keep talking about this wonderful movie, when you step up to the microphone, please, and again, in the interest of time, just limit it to your question. We don't need the sermon. And as much as the context is fascinating. We just ain't got time for it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> like, I don't mean to sound rude, but it's just where it is. So if you have a question, you are free to step up to the microphone and ask. Four. Um, I want to thank all of you for a very informative and rich dialogue. Because each of you in your own way spoke, each of you in your own way spoke your own specific truth, your insights that you saw into the movie. And personally, as a neuroscientist, I really appreciate that because we really do have to understand ourselves. Two things. Understanding Killmonger. Agent Ross told us he's one of us. Mm. We didn't see his mother. Maybe in the first scene, there was a picture of a woman on the wall. But he was raised a fatherless child, right? He was a victim of complex trauma which many of us experience in this society chronically, continually. Second thing, he was a narcissist, right? He didn't represent me. The most important thing is the narrative structure of the film. Kugler made him disrespect women so you could disidentify with him. So you could not have empathy for him until the final scene. It's a very powerful writing in the film. It, you really have to get into the writing of the film. What was going on in his mind? He had all of his people go to Africa. OK, I'm going to stop. Y'all want to hear some more? Come by Inner City Studies tomorrow, 11 o'clock. Two hours. Thank you. I Thank think you. That's exactly right, though, because I felt empathy for him uh, as he stood in front of the the display at the mm -hmm. museum. I felt mm -hmm. empathy for him as he he uh, I, I had guessed his identity by then as he looked at the artifacts of his experience and and um, and I felt I felt that same kind of longing myself. So I right. did feel empathy for him. Uh, all along, and even as he uh, 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 did all of his slaying, I felt the weight of what it means to be a, a parentless a child. Right. 
and, and I felt the weight of, 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 of what would it have meant to discover your father's body? Right. Right. I, 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 my mother was murdered when I was a teenager. I didn't discover my mother's body. But if I had, how different would my experience be now? Mm -hmm. So, so I felt empathy for him all along. It's not just the last moments of his life, uh, and but and I also felt the weight of, of 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 that that what Bell Hooks calls the the uh, the killing rage. Mm -hmm. You know that that's like a virus that has really wrecked our community. Is is currently wrecking our community. This has really been a powerful week, uh, climaxing with this event today. Earlier this week, uh, over at the University of Chicago, uh, there was a presentation, a, a global look at the challenges facing black Chicago. Alan Bozak and a host of others were on the panel discussing this whole concept of this, this need for global unity amongst black people. And of course, uh, Nikki Giovanni just yesterday was here in Chicago uh, talking about her book and you know her whole experience as a black woman and relationships to uh, the struggles that black people have faced. And then of course the context here today. So my question, because I want to be obedient to the uh, order of the day, it was mentioned about balance and harmony, profound. And how can we achieve or leverage balance and harmony across the diaspora in a kind of a global sense? How can we bring ourselves as black people together, which was part of the, the theme that Killmonger was striving to achieve. How do we have a, a concern about our struggles universally, not just in our own individual context? Thank you. You know, I, I wonder, sorry. I, I wonder if it does get rooted in love. You know, I, I don't count myself amongst the, the most well-read. And so the only bell hooks, book that I've read is um, on black people in love. And it was a very slow read because it was so dense. And she took the subject of love so seriously. Um, and it wasn't until later that I started reading more about interdependence of health and because I work in public health and how my, my existence is related to yours. Um, and so I take care of myself to take care of you. Like you get your flu vaccine so your grandmother doesn't get the flu, um, you know even if I could handle it personally. Um, and that's part, I think, what, what hurt me so much about Killmonger is that he didn't come from a place of love at all. He came from a place of pain and, and rage. It was all justified, um, but he didn't actually seem to care about the rest of the community. He cared about revenge. Um, and I think that's what really just broke my heart for him, is that I could relate so much and I just want him to be like, no, like, you know, you're gonna do this because it's for all of us. And, and it never seemed like that was really what, what he was turning the corner on. Um, so I would just like to say that I think love is truly the answer, but there's so many paradigms of love mm. that, uh, that uh, we need to separate, I, I think African Americans in particular need to, to forego the, the evangelicalism's definition of love, uh, and to 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 search out uh, what other Christianities have said about love, other religions have said about love, and to uh, to pursue them and, and and embody them and 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 be love. So so yeah, I just want to caution against that evangelical idea of love that means, you know, I love who acts right, mm -hmm. who, who mm -hmm. I love who, uh, who mm -hmm. uh, fits my definition of pious enough. 
you know, uh, so. To, to, to that point, uh, we, so we're talking about different languages. I do think I agree with the notion of love being the foundational premise upon which everything must rest. Um, in Igbo, to say I love you is to say ifunanya or ifunanya. And if you translated it literally in English, which is always difficult because English is a very flat language, um, it's I see you. I see you. I see you in my eye, Anya's eye. So it's I see you with my eyes. I see you in my eyes. So it's to see each other, mm -hmm. that's to love. Mm -hmm. So just the acknowledgement of your existence that I oh, see you, that is the epitome of love. And if we embody that as a philosophy, and that was the bedrock of our existence, it would transform every society and every community. Um, and so I think that is it. And I always come back to when you say that you love someone, or you love your community, or to love yourself, it's because we are. And we all want to be acknowledged that we exist. And when we acknowledge our humanity, it allows us to treat each other with what they call the golden rule, right? Um, and that's what, I, that's what I take out of that when we think about what can we do globally across the diaspora. The other thing is to recognize the bridge builders. So we often overlook the role of Killmonger's father and the role of Nakia. Killmonger's dad left Wakanda. Killmonger's father was radicalized in Oakland. Killmonger's father was willing to stand against Wakanda because of what he felt was right. He was a bridge builder between Wakanda and the entire African American community in the United States. He left for the cause of justice. And we rarely ever talk about the role of Killmonger's dad. We also don't really talk about Nakia, who also left, in the movie at least. Mm. She left Wakanda because she felt that they needed to be doing more. She was a spy going to, she was in Nigeria in the beginning of the film, saving these girls. She was a bridge between two worlds. She was the one who was in T'Challa's ear, telling him, pushing him, encouraging him, we need to do more, we need to do more. She was a bridge builder. So I think about that as what can we do across the diaspora. Folks like me who have double cultural context. I live on the west side of Chicago. So I identify with the west side. I'm from the original west side, <laughs> West Africa, right? <laughs> but I'm doing, right. But the bridge, doing this work, because we recognize our shared our shared experience, our shared history, and the fact that I see you and I'm amongst you. And I think that is, is and can be transformative. Yeah, I agree. Um, love, I agree with the whole love train. And love is understanding. And I think when we're thinking about the diaspora, we got to understand that not everybody left for the same reasons or started traveling for the same reasons and to understand how to love somebody is to understand how they left. If you were, if you left being drug away, then that needs to be considered when someone is considering you coming home and just understanding how to love you and all the different ways we can love. I just want to mention when we think about love and really seeing someone, uh, just to build on what Dr. Terrell said, there is what I consider to be a pathology a particular pathology embedded within the Christian tradition that needs to be named, and that there's a, a, a historical line between Apostle Paul, who says that the gods you worship in ignorance have been revealed in Jesus Christ, right? all the way to those who talk about the anonymous Christian. So the Buddhist is really a Christian, they just don't know it. Right? The Muslim is really a Christian, they just don't know it. right? <laughs> So if I have to ascribe ignorance to you and to distort who you are as a prerequisite for love, mm -hmm. that's a problem. That's a problem. Right? And we need to be able to name that within our own traditions and to say this has real consequences for this kind of love that, that we're talking about. How you doing? 
everyone. How y'all doing? Um, I just wanted to um, like ask a question concerning how do we build our own Wakanda here, right? Um, in America, for instance, or what I would say in America because this is my homeland. But the thing is, um, yeah, like earlier I was hearing how um, you all were saying how like just seeing each other is um, also a form of love and how like love is definitely needed. And even Holly, I heard Holly, Holly she's excellent. Um, I love what you had said up there. Um, especially when um, um, one of the um, moderators had said, how do we connect to the ancestors? And you said, well, it's how we treat each other. You know, just seeing each other on the streets. You know, this is, these are ways in which we can communicate with the ancestors as well. And um, in a time like this where like we're being, folks who do that type of work is being labeled black identity extremists, you know, but that's having this self love and, you know, seeing like the goodness and the greatness in each other's achievements and our history and our culture and heritage. Like, I just, you know, would like to pose that question to you all. Like, how do we manifest that in today's time where it's like our identity, um, whether we identify with whatever within um, society, our identity, especially with um, like um, being melanin, melanin rich and um, going through our, our history and um, struggles and the strive for um, self-determination, like um, I just would like to see or pose to you all, like how do we um, come up with the Wakanda um, where we can all support each other, where it can be um, inclusive, where it can be um, interdependent, you know, as well as um, self-reliant. Uh, it's similar uh, in a sense. I just want to first say to all of you, Afunanya. Yes. I see you. Yes. I love you. And what are you going to do? Because we are here because of a piece of entertainment. And look what it did to us, with us. It's about us. It united us. We have a unity that we need to do something with. So tell me what you intend to do with it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forming mine right now. So, just, so. I, I want to respond to both questions uh, very simply. I actually think in terms of the question about how do we create our own Wakanda, I, I really think uh, we have been creating our, our own Wakandas for years, mm -hmm. but we never really appreciated them. Uh, and this is why I think having conversations with ancestors who may never have gotten PhDs but wrote letters and had conversations is important. I, I thought that uh, my, my dear sister on the panel who talked about the Igbo greeting, I see you. I, I thought about the fact that black folk, uh, even though we may have been completely disconnected from the Igbo language, we still, when we saw a brother or a sister on the street, I see you, I see you. So even unconsciously, there was continuity of African identity. We didn't even know it. Uh, there, it, it, even if we can't have vibranium, uh, back in the day they would have something called quarter parties. That uh, when you couldn't pay your rent or pay your bills, this is not something you're gonna read uh, in the in the carols of the libraries of the University of Chicago. That, but back in in West Baltimore, where my parents are from, or from the West Side of Chicago, where I pastor now, that when folk couldn't pay you their rent, you without shaming anybody, without making somebody feel like less than or clowning them because they couldn't pay their rent. You just came over their house, they had a hat at the door, and you drop a quarter or a dollar or whatever you had in the hat so that they could, uh, in fact, pay their rent without feeling a, a, like a welfare recipient. There, there are so many ways that black people have continued to be black and continued to be African outside of the gaze of Europe. And, and I think when we learn to appreciate that just because our ancestors never went to college that they weren't dumb that they found ways to maintain uh, and hold true to their identity. Uh, and, and, and that's why I really want to behoove everybody in here uh, to get a hold of some of the early copies of the Journal of Negro History uh, from the Association for the Study of, of Negro Life and History, uh, started by Carter G. Woodson. Because in these, in these compilations, there are stories, letters, uh, poems, writings from people whose names we'll never see on a who's who of black America. But they were writing about what things that black people were thinking, things that black people were saying. 
Uh, and, and for what, in terms of the brother asked what I'm going to do, one of the things that I, I strive to do uh, as a pastor, as a 30, uh, as a 30 year old pastor, is to create a space uh, that makes everybody safe. A couple, I, I pastor a missionary Baptist church on the west side of Chicago. Some people call it North Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so there, there are still spaces where people who are uh, on the margins of society uh, don't feel welcome, but at the same time, we know they're there. And so one of the things that I try to do subliminally is to make sure uh, that, that the folk who are on the margins know that I'm on your side. Uh, and, and one of the ways, one of the things, and I'm not trying to do this to, 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 to give delusions of grandeur, but a, a couple of weeks ago, we had a brother come uh, after the sermon, join our church during the invitation to Christian discipleship. Uh, and, and he came to one of my associate ministers and whispered in her ear that, she, that he needed prayer. Uh, and, and then he came up to me and told me that he needed prayer because he just found out he was HIV positive. Just found out he was HIV positive, uh, and I knew immediately what the stigma was going to be in this missionary Baptist church on the west side of Chicago. So what I did is I grabbed that brother by the hand, walked him in the pulpit with me, pulled him close to me, and looked him in the eye and told him, we love you as you are. HIV positive, whatever your lifestyle or whoever your identity is, when you, we love you as you are. And to let them know that, we're, and I told them this, I said, if anybody gives you any hell or any slack about all who, of who you are, come tell me and I'll check them. We have to have that type of boldness where we want to see Wakanda uh, on earth as it is in heaven. I, I want, you know, this would be interesting, this would be an interesting theological concept to go against Stanley Hauerwas, uh, that Wakanda is representative of what the kingdom of heaven or what the kingdom of God really could be. We, let's look at that. Maybe somebody that's somebody's PhD. I'm good on that. I'm done with writing. So y'all go ahead and work on that as a PhD, but that's what I try to do. I try to be a Wakanda pastor. I'm going to continue to teach uh, theology. Uh, uh, with the perspective that uh, that a theology that can brutalize people can never be normative, okay. and uh, and that uh, that that the theologies that matter most are those that come from people who suffer. That would be most of the world, and I'm going to try to uh, stretch my students' awareness not only of our struggle as African Americans. But most of the world is, is similarly oppressed. And, uh, and we, they have to realize that and, and make connections between the, the black struggle and the Palestinian struggle, the black struggle and the Rohingya struggle, the black struggle and the Tamil struggle, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue to teach in that fashion, uh, following uh, a great ancestor who is uh, right now very ill, Dr. James Cone. As we speak, he's very ill, so uh, much uh, bosom heaving prayer for him. Can I ask one more question? We can take it home with us, right? To our parents. of an archetype in our community. Yes. And to be indifferent to him is to miss a whole dynamic yes. in our community. Yes. I'm not indifferent. Mm -hmm. The question still stands. We have to acknowledge that his father was assassinated. He was murdered. And that he killed him he was abandoned. Right? And he comes back to these people seeking some sort of family, and he is not accepted. Of course, he's coming. This, this is the absolute last thing I'm going to say because I feel like I'm talking too much. Uh, but I, that's been one of my gripes with a lot of black theology. That black theology, even in, in how it manifested itself in the civil rights movement, was obsessed with middle class Negroes, or if they weren't middle class Negroes that were acceptable. That's why we like Tupac, but don't black theologize church. around that's Biggie. Black church theology. That ain't black theology. Well, I mean, no, I, I think I mean we can agree to disagree. I, I, I think 
I, I think that there has been, even in, 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 in how black theology has approached hip hop, we, we deal with the hip hop artists that are acceptable. We deal with quote unquote Nas. We deal with Tupac uh, because Tupac was quote unquote outwardly uh, prophetic. Uh, but we don't deal with the nihilistic mindset that you see in Biggie's projects ready to die. Where I think with people like Biggie or Lil Turk or, or, or uh, Chief Keith, you really see the ideology of the folk that we say we want in our pews that are out in the street killing folk. And if we really understood what their mindset was, I think we could really do some relevant ministry. Uh, and, and so I, I, I do think that Killmonger is representative of a lot of the brothers. Uh, yeah, Killmongers in our families that we know that are gang banging, but we don't really want to have that conversation with them because we're scared of them. And because we're scared of them, we won't have the honest conversations. Why are you a killmonger? And what can I do to bring the inner child out of you that saw that brutality and now wants to uh, inflict violence in revenge? Uh, and so I, I, I definitely uh, agree with your point, sir. And so, yeah. Well, not only do we have killmongers in our families, they start churches. People start churches for all kinds of reasons, right? <laughs> People go to seminaries for all kinds of reasons, right? So I don't find myself indifferent to Killmonger. I think many people uh, feel uh, Killmonger, and it can manifest itself in a variety of ways. Um, but I think, as I said earlier, it's a matter of us stepping back and not immediately wanting to either revere him or condemn Killmonger, but to understand his complexities, right? And to have points of, of relevance. Um, I think for me, one hopeful aspect of the film was that even though Killmonger doesn't live, right, this is a character who said the sun will never set on Wakanda. Right? He's got this imperial mindset, right? Right out of the, the, the uh, that, I mean, that's British Empire. But he does see the sun, right? And he sees the sun as Wakanda ought to be. Right? So even though he doesn't live, there's something important. That, for me, that, that's a note of hope. Right, that no matter, and for me this is, a, this is a theological principle, that no matter how deep a pathology is in an individual or a culture, there is still something that is, that although it is being corrupted, it is still salvageable. Right? So that, so that we have to um, not buy into the kind of nihilistic thesis. Right? We have to kind of say that yes, there may, there's some violence in our communities that may not make sense to me, but it makes sense to somebody, right? <laughs> right? There is a logic there that has to be unpacked and understood with great sensitivity. Right? So again, I think it's, it's upon us to, to understand it. I think Killmonger is a, both a lesson, a warning, hmm. as well as a pathway to redemption for what Killmonger represents. Um, the warning to me is that without a basis in love, you can't build anything. And he didn't build anything. We can identify with the anger, with the bitterness, with the revenge, but those cater to the lowest forms of ourselves. And it's not the basis upon which to build a society, to build a relationship, mm -hmm. to build anything that, will, that speaks to life. And that was very evident because he was followed by death. The scars on his body were representations of death. Mm. He killed as a means to an end. That destructive force cannot coexist with a philosophy that's based on balance and harmony. So he became an aberration. But he became an aberration in part because of the dereliction of duty of his people. Mm. That's the warning. We have to meet the killmongers where they are. And part of that means being honest with ourselves about how we have carried out our duty to bring our people along with us. I think that's the path forward. Well, and that relates to your earlier point too about, you know, the system that they had set up and that they had respected for generations allowed killmonger to occupy seat because they had created they created, maintained, and respected a tradition that didn't critique the head leader. That itself we see replicated throughout our communities that we have untouchables. And none of us are above, I guess, the law. 
it was the dark. And as we're developing that for ourselves, making sure that we have uh, enough respect for each other, that we, there is no king, there is no, uh, you know, second kind of Martin King to come up us up. We all have a to help create that that norm. So, I think I think that we might so readily get it that sometimes um, us being killmonger in that or to prove how we approve ourselves or keep ourselves at it. So, be in like in our own ego. to even embrace him, knowing he coming home, you know. And we shall end on that note. Let us give our panelists a round of applause. And on behalf I want to plug your Institute of Property Economics for the panel. Yes. On behalf of the Byron Rustin Society and the Murray Rustin Social Justice Institute of the Summit of the Whit Proctor Conference, Thank you all for your time and have a great evening.